QC Pod is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. This is QC Pod. I'm Jason Tuga. QC Pod features the people, projects, movements, and ideas that make up the Queen's College community. To learn more, visit us at queenspodcastlab.org slash qcpod. Today on the QC Pod, we are shining a light on one of our students' new projects. Part of our mission is to give CUNY students a platform to express themselves creatively. And today we want to present Jonathan Leon's new podcast, In the Cut. In the Cut focuses on the intersection of sports and content creation. And in today's episode, Jonathan interviews Lakers content creator and YouTuber, Brayden Figueroa. You can subscribe to Jonathan's podcast by searching In the Cut on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. Hey everyone, you're listening to In The Cut Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Leon. Hey everyone, I hope you're having an amazing day. I have a very special guest in today's podcast. His name is Braden Figueroa, also known as B-Figgy on social media. He's a content creator for the LA Lakers. He's also worked for the University of Oregon and other projects for companies such as Nike, Converse, Vogue magazine, and many others. He also has a YouTube channel where he posts lifestyle videos and vlogs. Brayden, thank you for coming on the podcast. Great to have you on today's episode. Thank you for having me. We just cracked open the monster. We're ready to go. It's uh, 1135. I'm ready, man. I'm ready. So let's get started. What do you love the most about video production? What do I love most about it? I think that it's always changing. You know, it's so... I think that when I was in college, I was just trying to find something that I enjoyed doing. Like most people, you're just trying to figure it out. You're very lost. And up until shit, junior year, spring term, I was in bio. I was a bio major. So I was just struggling, getting absolutely rocked in human. I was a he, or no human phys. I was human physiology because I was trying to be a vet. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is they come into college or or they don't go to college and they're trying to figure out stuff and they're just really frustrated with life because they think that they should know like all the answers. I think that's probably the most fun part of life. But it, when you're first starting, it can seem just like this huge mountain that you're never going to climb. And it's a, it's a very rewarding process to try and find the thing that you actually enjoy doing. And I don't think that, I think that everyone's like, oh, you have to, you have to do this one thing like forever. Like you don't have to do that. You can really just pick and choose. Like it's your life. You can do whatever it is that you want to do with it and spend your time allocated to whatever it is that you want to spend it with. What would be your advice to those who have a passion for content creation, but are still unsure if they should completely invest in it? Or the, the things that they might not go the correct path is you're never going to really know, right? You can never know like, oh, what if I did this? Because you don't want to spend your life dwelling on the f- or on the past. But I think that if there's doubt in your mind that you're not making the right decision, you should try and reevaluate that and try and get to Try and change that path because you can change that path. You're really young. You know, you could change the path when you're like, fuck, I just spilled monster all over the phone. Hold up. We're just going to take a brief 30 second intermission. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for the brief intermission for my 80% monster spill. Ah, Where were we? I read that you started your freshman year of college creating fitness vlogs. I'm sure it took a lot of time working on them. What was the best way you learned different editing methods? Was it through YouTube or just trial and error? You know, I, I would just watch the best people and that that's how I would learn. I would just sit down like like you were probably studying for some accounting midterm the other day. And that's exactly what I would do with the best guys in the video space. So I would watch like guys like Sam Calder, Gibson Hazard. Um, I'm trying to think there, there's like a handful of them. I don't I didn't watch a ton of people's stuff because I, I personally didn't think a lot of stuff was like spectacular. But I was like, OK, I, I know that these people's things are spectacular. These like handful of people that I'm watching, I'm like mesmerized by what they're making. So I was like, if I can just try and mimic what these guys are doing, I'm going to land somewhere close to them and I'll figure, I'll figure it out along the way. I'll kind of find my style and refine things. Cause I think everyone gets hung up on trying to find their style in like the first months of like them making stuff when really like you're still finding your style like six years in, 10 years in, you know, I feel like uh, your style is ever, if you're really good at it, your style is always changing. I think. 
That's just me personally. I think you're all you can always get better at your craft. So does that mean your style is constantly changing even with in-game content? No, nah, I wouldn't necessarily say with like the in-game stuff because that's like systematic and I'm just like I can't control what's happening in the game, you know? So I'm like I, I feel like at a Laker game or in sports in general, you're almost taking like a documentary approach, but I have watched so many games and I've shot so many games that I know exactly where things are going to take place. Well, I'm like, okay, like two seconds before the tip, like LeBron's going to throw that chalk toss. And I've missed that shot like so many times because I forget. Um, but that's just like one example I can think of. Or like, oh, they're going to, they always huddle up right before and it's going to happen like right here. So I just need to make sure that I'm in a good spot so I can get a good shot of X or whatever it's going to be. How long did it take for you to figure out the different routines that players have? Or certain plays that you know are most likely going to happen. Um, it you know it takes you some time. I can't I can't give you like a t- specific like estimate because I think it's different with every person with every team. I'm pretty quick at. Um if I can just work with somebody like a few times, like one or two times, I can get their tendencies and their patterns. Like LeBron, okay, like this is just an example of this. Like with football and with Oregon, Justin Herbert, I knew that he'd always hit this one receiver like on this out route. So if this receiver was in and he was in this specific spot, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna just look for this guy because I think that Herbie's gonna throw this like out route to this guy and he always gets it inbound. So I try and set up for that shot. Um, and similarly with like LeBron and AD, there was, there's just like, I've watched them play so many times through my viewfinder that I'm like, okay, if 80s, um, if LeBron has a guy on him and he's driving to the hoop and 80s just like right to the left of him, I'm almost certain there's going to be a lob coming. So I'm just ready for the lob. And it's like, I think in my first year I was missing that shot a lot because I just wasn't, I, you just, you literally have to know where they're going to throw the ball because they throw the damn ball so fast and they're so athletic. Like they're the best at what they do. So you got to be able to keep up with that, that level of like how fast they throw the ball, where they're at and the whole nine yards. So I think it, it's just one of those things that different for every game, different for every team, but you shoot them like one or two times, you just have to really be paying attention to where they're at and what they like to do, who they like to throw to, who like they like to pass to or whatever. Going back to when you first started, when did you know it was fully time to invest into content creation by like buying better equipment or software? That's a good question. Um, I actually had, I think my mom split the Sony a6500 with me for my birthday one year and I remember it was really expensive like for a camera I think it was 1400 bucks that's like insane right like that's so much money to ask your mom to like drop some cash with you on a camera so I asked my mom and all my whole family like pulled money together to help me buy that camera and I had like 700 bucks or something to like help on my side I had just done like a job and I was like if you guys can help me like get this I I think I can like try and make this happen and they I'm really grateful for my family for doing things like that for me because I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, I'm self-made because they really did help with a lot of this process. And we're very, um, my mom specifically and and my whole family, but my mom specifically was very enthusiastic and understanding of, um, that I wanted to just do something different. So I'm like really grateful for her because I probably wouldn't have been so motivated and fired up to do this do this whole thing if she wasn't in my corner. I think you really do need friends and family in your corner because it's different and you don't get fucking paid. Like you don't come out of school making like a hundred grand, like some of these jobs, you know, you might want to make shit for the first few years until you figure it out and you get your name out there. So I think it's a very, um, it's a very, very difficult career, but very rewarding and very fulfilling. It seems like your family was fully behind you, pushing you into getting into video content creation. Did they ever have any doubt since it was a career path that they weren't used to hearing or knowing much about? Yeah, I feel you. I don't think it was. I think my mom just trusted me. And she was like, she knew that I was, I'm going to put my heart and soul into like whatever it is that I do. I'm going to figure it out. Like I'm not going to be poor doing something. I was just going to figure it out. I was like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm not going to be another starving artist. Like everyone tells you that. Um, everyone was always telling me like, oh, you can't fucking make money doing the camera stuff. Like no one makes any money doing that. And I was like, I just find that hard to believe. Like, I don't think that's true. I see people doing it. And like half of those people are fake flexors on the gram. So it's, I think it's, that that's tough too, right? Is to like, you compare yourself comparing yourself to people is the, is the enemy but you compare yourself to these people online it's inevitable and you're like oh these people who look like they're having a really fun time they're crushing it but you don't know anything behind the scenes and so like out of that group of people maybe half of them actually are doing it for real for real you know but I knew that I was like I could be one of those people like why why not me why why can't I do that you know if I'm willing to put in the work every day I feel like in a certain amount of time 
I'm going to catch up to those people that are doing this full time and getting paid what they deserve to be paid to make videos. That's really great to hear. I don't think you ever mentioned that before in any of your other videos or interviews. So thank you for sharing that. I don't think I, yeah, I don't think I have mentioned that. I, I do. It's just like the content space is such a, it's such a game of you versus you. And we get all caught up in like looking at other people's work and whatnot, but really like all you can control is yourself. All you can control is, you know, how, how much work you're putting in and then the hours behind the computer and the hours in the field. That's all you can control who you reach out to. You can't control what clients come knocking at your door. So you just have to be able to, to like put in your sites, those things that you can control and do your very best to make them as good as you can. Going back to Oregon, you apply for the marketing team. When did you know you were ready for that job? Shit. I didn't know if I was ready for that job. I just, I was such a, okay. I was so confident in myself. I was overconfident because I thought I was like, yeah, I'm good. Like I can go shoot a football game. There's so much to learn about football, about about, like even a basketball game. Like there's so many little things that you don't really think that, um, that matter. Like, okay. Hypothetical. Like when you shoot basketball, you don't use the, the 180 degree shutter rule. Um, usually when you shoot any video, your shutter, your shutter speed is always double your frame rate, but when you do fucking sports, you have to do it just a little bit more than double because the ball goes so fast, it looks blurry if you slow it down. So that's just like one thing that one thing that I can think of that you would only know if you were really good at shooting sports. So there's always, there's always so much to learn about everything that we're encapsulated in. What would you say was your favorite piece of content that you shot at Oregon football or basketball? We talked about this last night on our podcast. I think the most fun thing was when Oregon beat Washington my junior year and everyone stormed the field I was right there in the end zone for when the guy like crossed the plane and I was like I sprinted directly over in that huddle and I was like whoa like I'm in the huddle like I was right there with the guys being like picked up and stuff and as that's happening you can just see the the fence of Otten like just swarms of kids just like coming into the stadium and that was probably one of the coolest games I think I've ever shot and I was vlogging the whole game so it was funny because I have a video that I think my boss at the time asked me to take down which is just unreal yeah he asked me to take down that vlog I think because I wasn't supposed to be vlogging the game but then like random note like six months later when I graduated and I was working at the Lakers, he, he apologized and said he, that he should have let me post those vlogs because they were really entertaining. They were great pieces of content um, and they would have done well for Oregon. Like if we would have done like a vlog series, but it's okay. It's in the past. It doesn't matter. Um, and he was a really, really cool boss. It was awesome. But that game was probably the craziest fucking game. And I remember my that boss, that specific boss, grabbed me and goes, hey, I need you to go to the locker room. Like I have to go do this. Like you have to cover the locker room. Don't mess it up. And I'm like, holy shit, like if I mess this up, like I'm the only, you know, that's kind of a weird thing. Like the camera. The, so like if you shoot a TV game, right, there's like 20 TV cameras, like no one's going to miss the shot. But if you're documenting something like that and no one gets it, it's gone. The memory's gone. Like no one's ever going to see that, that memory or the light of day ever again, which is kind of weird. It'll be encapsulated in that locker room forever, but no one would have seen it. So I think that was cool to be able to capture all that stuff in the locker room. And like Phil Knight, I was, I remember like staying there and I'm filming like the coach and Phil Knight, we're just touching shoulders just me and Phil Knight. It was super crazy. Such a surreal moment. So fun to just be there and see that energy. And then I think that night we just went out and had a crazy party. Like the city was just crazy because we won that game. So that, that was, uh, that was probably my favorite, favorite game to film in college. So is that something you would have pitched to them to make a documentary series, whether it be basketball, football, or any other collegiate sport? I wasn't, I, I honestly, I just, I just wasn't there yet. I wasn't there yet in my career. I was still learning everything. You know, I was still learning like so many things every dude, like every day we'd go shoot. I was learning stuff, even though I was like decent at the cameras. Like I tell people this a lot, like me and my friend, um, Adam, we kind of like reverse engineered how to learn how to edit videos because no one, we didn't have teachers. We didn't have like a true teacher. Right. So like I taught him whatever I knew. And then he went and like learned a bunch of shit on his own. So it was like this little game of like cat and mouse of just learning as many things as we could and just be like, Oh, like I just learned this today. Like, did you know that? Like, no, I didn't know that. Um, because video, there's so many different aspects of it to learn. You can only know so much, right? That's why a lot of, that's why like most of the best people in video space and crave space are specialists because it's so hard to learn, know everything. You, you just, it's not possible not possible to know everything it's really possible to be really good at one thing though so there's so much that goes into video editing and all that 
how do you remember that when you're shooting a video for a certain project or a brand repetition right i mean repetition confidence is gained by repetition so to be confident in your work you have to have repeated it thousands of times i think i think i i go by the thousand time rule but what i used to do like to practice what i'm being a little exa- i'm exaggerating a little bit with the thousand thing but i have edited like literally thousands of videos thousands of them that's why i'm good at editing videos yeah and i've shot i ha- i don't think i'm as strong of a shooter as i am an editor i think i'm a great shooter i'm not a per i'm not like i'm in no way shape or form like the best. Um, and I think that that's something that really fires me up and it's exciting to be like, yo, I got work to do. You know, I got work to do in the shooting world. I, there's so much room to get better and to make my shots better. Cause I think I'm already a great editor, but I've made thousands of videos and that's why I'm a good editor. That's why I'm able to make videos in 15 minutes. Cause I've spent five years being able to do them in 15 minutes or six, seven, whatever, however long I've been editing, you know, that's how I can make them in 10 minutes. And and make them like really high. That's why I can make a video for the Lakers in under 15 minutes and just have it sent off and uploaded. Yeah, that's one thing I noticed just by following them on social media, particularly on Instagram. They're really quick with their video and photo posting during the games. They're the fastest. The Lakers are the fastest team in the league. I'm at me on that. I think so. I don't, I'm just kidding. There's so many great social teams. No, I don't know, dude. I really do think though that they probably do get it up the fat. They they get up live content the fastest in the NBA. I'd be willing to like put that put money on that because they they have such a good system and um, we didn't have a system like this at Oregon. We had like a we had a jumbled system that we didn't have as. Uh, Let's see. How do I even phrase this? We could get content up really fast at Oregon, but they have more, um, more hands and more bodies that are because like our designer also was like shooting and stuff, just a different layout of the team. Um, so the Lakers are just, you have someone that's just dedicated to like cutting the clips during the game. And we just didn't have as deep of a team. We needed the team to shoot so we could get all the content. Cause there's so much stuff going on game days and we would rather have shooters than editors. So it was just different. It was just like a different, it was a different team feeling, but they both work really, really well. It's awesome. You graduate from college and decide to start your own video production company. Why move to Bali during its startup and not somewhere like LA or in the States? Everyone at school, when senior year comes around, right? Every combo, where are you going to get a job? Like, where are you going to work? Where are you, what, 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 what internship do you have lined up? That's what everyone's talking about. Every conversation, in every hall or like in whatever program you're in. That's what everyone's talking about. And I was like, dude, I don't think I had read a book. Um, this one book by Tim Ferriss called the four hour work week. And I was like, dude, I just think that I don't think that like that going to like an agency is bad. I don't think that's bad. I don't, I think it's great. I think it's probably like the best experience you'll get is probably going right out of college and working at a big company, learning how they run things and how they operate. And if you want to do something by yourself, then taking that knowledge and going and doing it by yourself or like starting a new company. Right. I think that's probably the smartest way to come out. If you want to be an entrepreneur, go work at a company or like if you have like an entrepreneur mind, you want to start a business business, go and work at a business to understand how they run things and take what you like from them and go do it better. It's probably the best way to do it. But I was like, I was reading this book and I was so pissed off at like the world. I don't know why, but I was just mad. And I was like, fuck it. I don't want to work for somebody. Like, I'm just going to figure it out myself. That That's how you could get a business, right? You do, you work, you you learn by doing. Um, so I was like, you know what? I talked to a lot of people and they're like, why don't you go do it? Like if anyone can do it, you can do it. And I was like, you're right. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try this whole business thing. I'm going to start a company and we'll see how it goes. And Bali made the most sense because Bali, we are earning us dollars, but spending rupiah. So, right. So like we were getting all our, all our monies in us, but I'm just spending rupiah. So I'm living at like a, like a quarter of what I would live like here. The only problem with the, with our little method is we thought we were going to go over to Bali and just like absolutely slaughter jobs. And we didn't have that many jobs. Once we got out there, it was more just like creating content by ourselves, but that was still super fun and that was worth it. Um, and I think it really does like make sense if you're a creator to, to plan like a month trip. Cause then you get content for just you just get the best stuff like Bali. Every corner is a picture spot or a video spot or whatever. 
you know? So you're just in a, you're in a haven with all these other creatives that are all doing very similar things. You get to meet people that are like, Oh, what do you do? Oh, this is how I make money. Like everyone makes money in such different ways. So you like, you might meet someone that's like a trainer and they like, Oh, we have a, I have a course on training. I live in Bali and I train clients here. Like, Oh, that's cool. That's totally different. That's, that's an interesting way to make money out here, you know? And I'm, and I crush it. So it's like, it's great to be around other entrepreneurs that are all trying to make money and hustle and grind. Um, not to be like hustle grind, uh, whatever, but, it, but it's like, it's cool to be around those people. And that's how I feel right now. Like living in this apartment, I'm around two other full-time creatives that are all doing really well and making great money. And there's like two more that are a block away from me. So it's just great to be in this little hub of all these like-minded driven people. But that's why we chose Bali and it's cheap as shit. I'm really cheap to live in Bali and it's beautiful. We had like a resort, a, like a mansion resort looking place. It was so sick. Um, hopefully we can go back and do that all again soon in the next year. I noticed that half of your YouTube content was filmed in Bali. So just the scenery was unreal. And I honestly think LA is pretty much overused at this point. Yeah, LA is definitely overused. So how did living in Bali improve with the projects you created? Bali, your I think when you travel, you get inspired again. And I think that when you're in one spot for too long, you can just become stagnant as a creative. So I think it's important to be able to see new things. Um, creativity is, is not a fixed amount of like creative juice, right? Like, I don't think I believe personally, and I think a lot of other people believe this too, is like my creativity for me comes in waves. Like I'll wake up one day and I'm just like not feeling it. And, and my stuff's not going to be good that I know I can, I've done it so long and I'm just like, Oh my God, like, I do not want to do this right now. And it, I don't know what it is. I just like, I could look at a project, cut it up a bunch of times, cut it up 10 ways. And I'm like, this is just awful. Like I hate this thing. Like, it's just not what I was visioning it to be. Um, so I think that when that creativity does come in waves, you, you go, and I don't consider that like a creative block, creative blocks is like a bullshit thing. I think, I think I consider it like you just need to step away go, go out and do something that do something else that you enjoy doing and then come back to it. Cause if you, if you give it the name creative block, then it turns into like a real thing. And then it's like a whole nother, that's a story for another day. Creative blocks, you know? So YouTube series and advice for upcoming creators. First, I want to ask what made you start uploading on YouTube again? I just like wanted a scrapbook of all the stuff I'm doing. I'm trying to make YouTube videos. It's just so hard for me because I get stuck doing stuff for other people, you know? So like those free days that I'm like, oh, I could edit it. YouTube videos take a really long time to edit. It takes like four to six hours and you don't get that time back. It's gone forever. So you know what I mean? I love to make those YouTube videos, but it's very difficult for me to find like a six hour slot of time in my week, but I'm, I'm working on it. I know I need to get on it. It's going to be, that's one of my goals before this year's over to get that cranking again, because it's really fun and cool to just talk to the, there's not a ton of people that like watch my YouTube. Um, it's probably like anywhere from two to 500 people, you know, around that range. So it's really cool to talk to them. Cause I feel like we have like an intimate connection it's cause it's just like, it's just this little squad of homies that watch my stuff. What would you say is your favorite video that you've put out? Honestly, I think mine's would have to be the how to journal video. It's something that I picked up on after watching your video. I started a journal on my iPad, if that counts. Oh, how to journal? Oh, that counts. Yeah, we'll count that. Um, let's see. Favorite video. Favorite video that I've made on YouTube. Shit. I don't know, dude. I got to go back and look through them. I've made some ones that I really like. I got YouTube, like no, no BS, the YouTube stuff that I make, even though it's not like fancy, I love the, making those type. Those types of videos are the most fun because no one, here's the thing. And like creatives will understand what I'm talking about. There's no better feeling than not being told what to do when you make a video. I don't know. I, I just love, I love making the YouTube videos. These are all fun to make. Let's see which one of these. Is, oh, the drone crash with Babin was really funny. I loved that video or no, no, no. I think, I think the most fun video was the one where <laughs> insane. This hurt really bad drone crash. That one, that video is crazy. The one with me and Chase where I lose the drone like on the side of a mountain. That video is fucking crazy. I also like the Lakers tutorial video that you put out. The one that works with uh, Premiere Pro. That one was really good and um, really taught me a lot. 
Thank you. I'm, I'm, I think I'm just trying to think of creative ways to really make stuff that people enjoy too. I'm just so busy with, so I, say I finish the Lakers stuff, right? Nine to five, whatever, nine to six, nine to seven, whatever. Um, we finish the day and then I make stuff for you guys on TikTok. Like I bang that stuff out and I really like making those TikToks, but shit. So for example, like my day just changes a lot. Like when I was younger, I was getting to work out very frequent, like seven times a week, six times a week. Now I'm barely working out like three or four times a week. I'm just like, I'm still learning how to be, um, the best version of myself right now. I'm just figuring it all out. Um, so I don't think that anyone out there that's listening that thinks that I have it all figured out. I have nothing figured out. No one has it fucking figured out. Like literally nobody, all my friends that I talk to that look like they have it really put together. Like, no, we don't. It's all a shit show. I think everyone's trying to figure out their own lives and figure out their path, their unique path. So if you're listening and you're like, oh, these guys, uh, these guys sound like they have, that we have nothing. No one has anything figured out. That's great advice going out to people to not to stress out, take a deep breath, think about what you want to do and go after it. Other than that, what would you say is your biggest advice for people that want to get into sports content creation? Like, um, the best way to get started. I think you got to start at the lowest level that you can find, whether it's high school or whether it's college. It's pretty, it's not super hard to, there, there's tons of newspapers that, um, that are around like local newspapers, right? That you could say, Hey, like I would love to, this is what I would do if I didn't have a direct, cause like if you're, if you go to, if you go to college, you get the unique opportunity to directly just pop in and end up working for the team. Cause you're just, you, you're a student there and then you could graduate work there, whatever. It's a very, easy route. If you don't go to school, um, the route that I would think would be the best is either to start at the high school level or start at the college level, hitting up people that work there and saying like, yo, if you, know, need, if you guys need an extra shooter, like this is what I'm capable of doing. This is other content that I've made. And I think it really helps if you have stuff that looks like their brand. If, for example, if you went to the chargers and your stuff is like, I'm trying to think how to word this properly. The Chargers brand is very, uh, it's funny, it's in your face, it's loud, it's like, they make memes on their page. It's very different than the Lakers. The Lakers page is very, very strict. Like it's great. It's like high quality photo, high quality. So is the Chargers, like high quality shit. Obviously it's great quality stuff. Very different brand tone, very different brand image. What I think of when I think of the Chargers isn't the same thing that when I think of the Lakers, right? If you were going to apply to a job for the Lakers, your content shouldn't look like the fucking Chargers. It should look like the Lakers stuff, right? So whenever you go to apply for something, look back at your stuff and be like, okay, if I show them this, are they going to be impressed by it? And is it going to be on brand tonally and visually and like all that good stuff, like colors, all that stuff, all that stuff needs to look and feel like they might've posted it. Um, and I think when you're going after a bigger brand, that's something to think about at the smaller level, it doesn't really matter, but you know, that's just a good, I think a good piece of knowledge to know is like, if you're going to send your stuff to a team, like make it look like they could post it so they can kind of envision like, Oh shit, if I hired Jonathan, like he's just going to fit right in here. This guy's great. He already understands our colors. He already understands the brand's vision, the brand's tone when he makes these videos, the song choice, all that stuff makes up the brand identity, all those factors. And there's a fuck ton more that I didn't mention that make up everything that we think of when we say a name of said brand. What I would do to get, to get the job, I would reach out to the high schools, reach out to the colleges, reach out to newspapers because newspapers get press passes. You need a way to get a press pass. That's the whole thing. You're not going to get a press pass normally by just saying, hey, can I get a press? No, they're not going to give you a press pass. It has to be for a reason, you know? So... Oh, I want it for my Instagram. It's not a good reason. You need to find someone that needs that type of content or hitting up a players on the team. Be like, hey, like, can we arrange this? And then like, yes, I'll put your name down to be a shooter at the game. It's really easy to do at the high school level. And then you can work your way up. Um, and I think it's a great, like, I have so many homies that were in my creator club course and whatnot that were like, oh, I really like sports, Braden. Like, how do I get into that? And I just helped them, like, just gave them some cold DMs, cold emails to send to potential high school kids and people that work at the high school and now they're working for the high school team. So those kids, for example, like those kids are in high school right now, they're going to be set up so well to go do it in college. Cause they've done it for three years. They're already way ahead. Those kids are like way ahead. Um, cause like I started like when, when did I start spring term of freshman year of college? So I was 19. You know, these kids are starting like 15 now. So by the time they get to school, they're going to be like just as good as I was when I came out of school, which is crazy to think about. So what are your future plans with the creator club? 
are you going to open up more spots for people or start an um, entire new course? So I'm making another one right now. I'm trying to feel out what exactly everyone needs the most of because I want to make it as valuable as I can. But I think you're getting just inside information, man. This podcast, so just get the people are getting inside info. This next course, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to remake. I'm going to have a course that's like video and photo, like the B-Figgy video photo course. That's a terrible name, but something like that, right? It'll be just video photo. The other side of it is I'm going to make another one that'll be smaller, but it'll be more intimate with me and the people that are in it. So hopefully what I envision is it's about building your portfolio, building up your website, building up your reel, building up your social channels, giving you the correct tools and the knowledge of what it takes to go out and do stuff for bigger brands, pitch people higher, all that good stuff. Um, and that would be more hands on me, like physically meeting with you to like make your website better, make your reel better. Talk about how we can make you as a brand or you as said business, whatever your business is going to be called better, more high you know, more, um, more high production value, all those little things, all the details and like contracts, all the things that you, people can mess up, put all that together and call it like something about like brand identity for people, like for creatives. Right. So they can begin to really jump into the world of production. That's what I think. I think that the other one sounds more fun to me to make. Um, but I think that there's a big demand for people that just want to learn about it. So, uh, and I, I think it'll be cool cause I'm going to, it'll be the first time I release it. So it'll be discounted. It'll be fun. And hopefully like creator club was basically like a guinea pig for all of this. Um, it was, it was fun to just see what people loved, what they didn't like, what could be better. So it was great. It was a great learning experience. And all those people that were in that worked their asses off and they have some way better work than when they got into it. Okay. I'm definitely going to be one of the first people to enroll in it. Also, do you have a set time frame for when you're going to release it? Let's go. I told people that it would be done at the end of, it'll probably be done at the end of November. Yeah, it should be fun. It should be, I, I just, yeah, I think, cause see what, what I want to do is I want to have something to where like you're going to school like this is like B figgy university, right? Like that's, that's how I kind of see it um, unfolding later down the line. Um, and hopefully, cause like, I'm just, a, I, I've just am very understanding of what it needs and what it takes for someone to be ready to like make content for specific sports is easy, but like for brand, I can like, I can look at something and be like this, this is what you need. This is what this is missing to take you to that next level. Um, so that's been, that's been cool. And it's been so sick to see the kids get jobs at like, I had a homie get a job at Ohio state. Um, so many Florida state, like all, all kinds of football jobs that people, you know, have got, it's just been, it's been fun. It's been a fun time. That's been the most rewarding part of everything I think that I've done in the creative space is seeing people get jobs. Like because of stuff that I've told them, which is crazy. Anyways, thank you, Braden, for coming on the podcast to share your experiences and your upcoming work. It was great talking to you. Also, for the people listening, don't forget to follow Braden. His Instagram and YouTube is at bfiggy. And don't forget to check out his podcast called 505, which should be coming out soon. Let's go, guys. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Make sure to shoot me a DM on the gram at BFiggy. If you ever have any questions, you ever just want to say what's up, talk. Let me know if you watched the episode, if you liked it. 505 pods coming soon. All right, guys. Peace out. Thank you for listening to today's episode of In The Cut. I hope you enjoyed it. Credit for the music used in today's podcast is Overblow by Ketza. You've been listening to QC Pod, the podcast about all things Queens College. We're on Twitter at QC Pod and on the web at queenspodcastlab.org slash QC Pod. Our theme music is Lake Monsters by John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants. I'm Jason Tuga. Thanks for listening. <laughs>